The air of the early Earth was not inviting, and that's an understatement. It was mainly hot, noxious gas spewing from volcanoes that, had you been around, would have burnt your lungs to a crisp if it didn't suffocate you first. Good times. But when the Earth cooled, the fumes dissipated, life as we know it could get a start. Two billion years later, oxygen made its appearance, along with animals that could breathe it. The air that was once packed with poisonous gas could now percolate with pleasant aromas, if we take the time to smell them. I smell the turkey, and I smell salt, and I smell the fennel just because I was just eating fennel. I can smell your perfume, and I'm, I'm actually not wearing perfume or today. soap, maybe? No, no soap today either. Well, it smells different when you're standing next to me than when you weren't. I should say, in my hands, are bacon and asparagus. I feel like I can smell the bacon, which I know can't be the case because it's not even cooking, but I have it so much on my mind. The air, you can't see it, usually can't feel it, but it carries a symphony of scents and much more. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. In this episode, most life couldn't survive without air. It connects our living planet and even the dead. Your next breath contains molecules exhaled by our ancestors. And no nose knows more about you than that of your dog. One sniff from a schnauzer reveals your secrets, and bathing won't help. But don't sell your own nose short. It can sniff out the right mate, maybe even save your life. So what's invisible but omnipresent and essential to your existence? In this episode, we make air apparent. It's easy to take air for granted. Its intangibility means we usually don't notice it unless it's permeated by scent or smoke or if the wind is blowing. Air seems to be the very definition of ethereal, yet it is not nothing. If we want to express the weightlessness of an object, we declare it lighter than air. But it depends on how much air you have. Fill a suitcase with air and your luggage will weigh more than it does without it. Now imagine scaling up. There's sort of a famous example where if you drew an imaginary cylinder around the Eiffel Tower in Paris, the volume of the air inside that cylinder would weigh more than the iron that is making up the Eiffel Tower itself. So air definitely has a weight. Uh, it has mass. It can push things. It can move things. It's a substance, just like everything else around us. So air may be eiffled with, but not trifled with. You can abstain from food and water for a few days, but can't go without air for more than a few minutes, not even Houdini. Life adores this perfect chemical cocktail. Today, the bulk of our air is nitrogen, which we pretty much ignore, as we do the trace gas argon. It's the oh-so-important oxygen that literally gives us room to breathe, whether we're sniffing, gasping, yawning, snoring, or letting out a long sigh. Humans and other animals are processing this essential gas. The air is circulating around the planet, and that means it's a physical connection between places and time. That breath you just took may include molecules of dust from a demolished temple, the snort of a woolly mammoth, or the air exhaled by a long-gone ancestor. Caesar's Last Breath is the title of science writer Sam Keen's latest book exploring the complexity as well as the secrets of the air around us not all of which were apparent to those ancient Romans. I mean, of course they knew that the wind could knock you over, or be pushing against you. What they didn't have an idea of is sort of the abstract idea that we have nowadays of a gas. The idea that something like water could evaporate and turn into a gas, or that there were substances, different substances like nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide in the air around us, and that they all had something in common, and that there was this mixture called the air that, again, as we were saying has mass, has properties like that. So of course they knew the wind and things like that existed, but they didn't have a good grasp on what the air might be made of or a lot of its properties and things like that. 
Uh, well, of course, they probably didn't know the words oxygen or nitrogen either. No, definitely not, no. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, since we're back in classical times, uh, let's consider the fact that uh, your book is entitled Caesar's Last Breath. But presumably you say that because, after all, whatever was his last breath, we get to share in that in some way. Yeah, the title, Caesar's Last Breath, comes from a sort of a classic problem, a challenge problem they give chemistry and physics students, where they say, figure out the odds that you're breathing in some of the air that Caesar exhaled during his last breath back when he was assassinated in 44 BC. And at first, the answer seems like, no way, like Caesar's breath could not still be around. I mean, a breath is about the most ephemeral thing you could think of. And the size of one breath compared to the atmosphere at large just seems so minuscule that you would think, no way, that, that, that breath has to have disappeared by now. But if you look at it a little more closely, you realize that, well, you know, there are actually so many molecules in a single breath, something like 25 sextillion molecules, which is a 25 with 21 zeros after it. That's how many molecules are in a breath. And those molecules are mostly nitrogen molecules, which are very hardy, very robust molecules that stick around for a very, very long time. So the question then becomes, which is going to win out? The very, very small number, which is how big a breath is compared to the whole atmosphere, or the gigantic number of molecules that have been spread across the Earth from Caesar's last breath? If you do all the math, figure everything out, it turns out that the answer is they cancel almost exactly. And it's almost a certainty that every time you take a breath, you're breathing in about a molecule or so of Caesar's breath. So it's this really direct material connection with someone who died thousands of years ago. I can't help but note that that number, 25 sextillion, is also roughly the number of uh, stars in the visible universe. So I don't know which number should impress me more, the number of stars or the number of molecules in Caesar's last breath. Et tu, Brute, here's mm -hmm. 25 sextillion uh, molecules of air. But, you know, if he had halitosis, we wouldn't know that, right? Because if we're only getting one or two molecules, uh, obviously that's perfectly okay. Yeah, so it's not, uh, you know, Caesar's last gas or something else like that, because a lot of those molecules would have uh, disappeared. There are more reactive molecules in the air than uh, the nitrogen that he was exhaling. So those molecules mostly would have disappeared, reacted out, something like that. So only some of the molecules remain, but they do remain. And really, there's no reason that it's Caesar that people usually put in the problem, as opposed to other people you want to mention. You could mention, you know, Confucius or Amelia Earhart or whoever you want to pick from history. Their breath is still lingering, still mingling in the air as well. Can you give me some idea of how long it takes or, you know, if somebody keeps over tomorrow before their breath, some of their breath, could be inhaled tomorrow in downtown Beijing? It wouldn't quite get there that quickly from someone in the United States, but within a week or so, it would have gotten to that point where some of the molecules would have made it all the way around the Earth like that. And then over a year or two, it would probably spread over the Northern Hemisphere. And within two or three years, it would be spread over the entire Earth. So it doesn't really take that long. Uh, climate scientists know pretty well how quickly air mixes and some of the patterns of that. But it takes a surprisingly short time. It's one of the reasons, one, another thing I talk about in the book is radioactive fallout and how that unfortunately has spread across the world too. So even in the very base of Antarctica, you can find little radioactive atoms that were spread from these nuclear bombs that we were testing back in the 1950s and 60s. So the air does mix. Things we do in one part of the world affect the air around the world. So it's a closed system. Whatever anybody does to the air, wherever they are, that will, within reasonably short period of time, you know, be detectable and maybe affect everyone. Yeah, it spreads around the world. It's not quite closed because you do have gases escaping a little bit into space now and then, the light ones like hydrogen, helium. You have oxygen going into creatures, creatures dying, and sometimes, you know, when they decay, you might have gases release, things like that. Or, you know, humans burning fossil fuels release some gases too. But for the most part, yeah, you're right, that what we do in one part of the world will affect everything around us. Now, this idea that the air is something that you know, might be made of other things, uh, that it's something that is worthy of study. I mean, that's fairly new. Most people know that the Greeks figured that everything was made of four elements and one of them was air. 
suggesting that air was just air. When did we <laughs> when did we start to learn that the air was actually a, a combination of ingredients product? Yeah, it was kind of a slow dawning over a few centuries. In the 16th century and 17th century, they kind of started to get an idea that not all gases were quite the same. Really in the 1700s is where you start to see um, the idea kind of come into its own and people start discovering a lot of different gases. So that's when people started discovering hydrogen and nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide and all kind of the classic big ones that we think about in the air today. You know, the name that comes to mind when I think of uh, discoveries about the air is Joseph Priestley and the discovery of oxygen. I mean, oxygen, everybody knows that oxygen is important to, to living things, but nobody knew much about that until Priestley came along, right? Yeah, there were actually a few different scientists, if you look historically, that get credit for discovering oxygen. Uh, Priestley's one, there were a couple of other ones, but Priestley's the one who usually stands out, probably the most important of those discoverers. He was an English preacher, mostly, but he liked to do some science on the side, sort of dabble in it. Well, he was doing some different experiments, and he noticed that there were different gases that were being produced that would, say, keep animals alive under bell jars. For instance, he might put a plant and an animal alive under a bell jar. And there's kind of this unfortunate history of scientists putting animals under bell jars and exposing them to different gases. And normally the animals just sort of expire. But in this case, he figured out, oh, the animal's living there. So this plant must be producing something that's allowing the animal to live. So he kind of realized, made this observation and realized that something more must be going on there. Today, of course, we do breathe oxygen. Uh, many animals do, but the atmosphere didn't always contain oxygen. Uh, it's had some major chemical compositional changes, uh, the air has. Can you take us back to the early Earth, maybe 4.6 billion years ago? The planet was obviously pretty hot, not exactly conducive to life as we know it now. What was the first air like, if, if anybody were there? <laughs> Yeah, the Earth has actually had, depending on how you count, about four distinct atmospheres in its history. Uh, the very first one was just some kind of leftover hydrogen and helium from the formation of the sun. It was kind of a wispy comb-over atmosphere. Uh, it blew away pretty quickly, but that was our first atmosphere. The second one was a lot of uh, volcano exhaust, so things like ammonia, a lot of carbon dioxide, uh, methane, kind of these hot, nasty, reactive gases. So again, not very conducive to life. Eventually, uh, nitrogen took over, and nitrogen became the dominant gas in our atmosphere. And actually, life arose on Earth during this long nitrogen phase. So life on Earth actually predates oxygen by quite a ways, which is a little hard to wrap our head around today. We normally think about oxygen as the essence of life, the stuff of life, but life on Earth really predates oxygen by quite a ways. And oxygen's only a latecomer onto the scene. It took a long time for microbes to evolve who are kind of producing oxygen as a byproduct. Eventually it started to build up in the air, and then some of these microbes eventually evolved to the point where they could utilize oxygen for an energy source. But yeah, again, life really predated oxygen by quite a ways. And the only reason today we have multicellular creatures like us that can do things like run and jump and think and build things is because of all this energy we can get from oxygen. So oxygen isn't essential for life, but if you want to have complicated multicellular life that can do a lot of great things, then you need something like oxygen around to give them more energy and power. Sam Keen, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Thanks for having me. Sam Keen is a science writer, and he is the author of Caesar's Last Breath, Decoding the Secrets of the Air Around Us. Coming up, this episode now goes straight to the dogs. Our beloved canine pals make scent maps of the world, and that means smelling us in embarrassing places. But for a dog, it's not socially awkward behavior. It's just information gathering. If it's not yet obvious, we're making air apparent on Big Picture Science. (laughs) 
Okay, maybe you're one of those masters of the financial universe type of people with a team of lackeys handling your stock transactions. But if not, you should look into Robinhood, an investing app that anyone can use and that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos, all commission-free. If you're just getting into the market, this is the way to invest and build your portfolio. It's easy to use, and it presents you with easy-to-understand market data and charts. You can build your wealth with a handful of taps on your smartphone. Oh, and did I mention that there are no commissions? So don't be intimidated by those big brokerages with their transaction charges and their bewildering complexity. This is a better way to get into the market and start growing that all-essential nest egg. And as incentive, Robinhood is giving listeners a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help build your portfolio. Sign up at bigpicture.robinhood.com. That's bigpicture.robinhood.com. The air is a conduit bringing its oxygen to our lungs and all kinds of odors to our nostrils. But not all odors are created equal. Many odors greet me during my workday commute. The perfumed cool air of a California morning, diesel exhaust. And because I ride public transportation, all manner of human odors naturally fermented or artificially applied. But there's one aroma that occasionally fills my nose with happiness. Usually the air at the Millbrae train station is not remarkable, but every now and then in the evening, the Millbrae station air is awake with the wafting aroma of chocolate. The odor is rich and warm and delicious. And I ask myself, is it brownies or just an enormous vat of bubbling melted cocoa and sugar. I don't know, but it is an atmospheric current of deliciousness running right under my nose and so incongruous to my surroundings. I wonder if it's an olfactory hallucination conjured by my tired brain. I'll inhale deeply in the hope that somehow magically that will produce the chocolate itself. I've never gotten to the origin of this bewitching smell, but now I'm going to. A little bit of research tells me that a half a mile from the train station is the likely source. So I'm going there now. I'm approaching the factory and it is starting to smell like chocolate. Welcome to the Guitar Chocolate Company. Ken Givich, Director of Microbiology. All right, so this is a bona fide chocolate company, and I'm guessing that you may be the source of that wonderful aroma that hits me occasionally at the train station. Yes, we are in the process of roasting cocoa beans, and the smell from those cocoa beans diffuses out into the air, and it smells like hot cocoa when you're standing outside somewhere away from the, the plant. Now, why is it that I just smell it occasionally? Um, and it seems to be only in the evenings, but maybe that's just when I'm returning home. But I don't smell it every day. It has to do with the wind direction. It has to do with humidity. It has to do with all the atmospheric conditions. But we're roasting pretty much every day. So it's out there, but you're just not smelling it. And so the roasting smell is quite full and aromatic. I thought it had to be brownies or cookies, but it's not. It's the beans themselves. It's the essence of chocolate, which are the cocoa beans. And part of the flavor development is created through that roasting process. Do you get used to the smell? I mean, at some point, does your nose adapt and you don't smell that wonderful chocolate anymore? As you approach the plant and smell it, you'll always recognize it. But when you're in the plant, you get used to the smell. Well, thank you very much. You solved this mystery for me. <laughs> you're welcome. As I leave the factory, the air is perfumed with the scent of roasting cocoa beans and I learned that I'm not imagining it. The aroma of chocolate really does fill the air at the train station because half a mile away there is a chocolate factory or should we call it a chocolate olfactory. Good sleuthing, Molly. I hope you'll bring some of that chocolate to the studio when you come in. Now, dogs track down scents routinely. That's what they do. They lead with their noses. Humans are born smellers too, but, you know, with the exception of the mouth-watering aroma of sweets, we often dismiss the odors that envelop us. Dogs do not. Smelling is how they map their world. For a dog, 
The air is filled with information. They have hundreds of millions more olfactory receptors in their snouts than we do, making them serious sniffers. Dogs can detect traces of explosives and even certain cancers. They can perceive scents that we can't, and we might experience more if we took a cue from them, says dog cognition researcher Alexandra Horowitz. She's the author of Being a Dog, Following the Dog into a World of Smell. I am following my nose along Amsterdam Avenue toward Dr. Horowitz's dog cognition lab at Barnard College. I am picking up odors of hot pretzels, cut flowers, Indian spice, and I imagine entering the dog cognition lab and being greeted by dog smells and a row of sniffing animals. First though, I meet Alexander Horowitz in her campus office. Alexandra, we're in your office at Barnard, but the dog cognition lab, I understand, is nearby, it's somewhere in the vicinity. If I were a dog, I could probably sniff it out. <laughs> well, we should maybe revise because this is really the dog cognition lab. The dog cognition lab is anywhere where we are studying dogs, essentially. So we do actually do some behavioral tests in this room. There's tape on the floor, so we are videotaping and monitoring what the dogs are doing. But I also study dogs out in their natural environment, in the parks. I go to owners' homes, I study dogs there. So kind of any place that their dogs could be the dog cognition lab. Okay, so it turned out the dog cognition lab was right under my nose. Dogs have some of the makings of good scientists. They are curious about everything. They can't stop collecting data, but since dogs don't submit their conclusions about what they smell to referee journals, Dr. Horowitz studies their sniffing behavior to make inferences about their cognition and what sniffers they are. Dogs have now been trained, detection dogs have now been trained to tell us when they notice all manner of object and really most objects have a smell potentially if you have the equipment to detect it. So that is everything from, you know, explosives detection dogs, they're cancer detection dogs, they're dogs who can detect um, bed bugs, of course, and any other varieties, many other varieties of insects. There are scat detection dogs. In other words, dogs are being used by researchers to find the scat, the excreta of wildlife populations that they're trying to canvas, but that are hard to see. There are diabetes detection dogs who can tell when blood sugar is dropping. So really you could put their nose in any direction, just tell them what it is that you want them to notice and they'll notice it for you. Dogs can detect all manner of objects, as you say, and how much do they need to detect? They need just a tiny bit, and, and, and how, how low does that, that concentration go? Right, they often need only a very little bit. So I think it's something on the order of a picogram, a trillionth of a gram of TNT or other explosive for an explosive detective, detection dog to, to notice it. That's at a far uh, lower threshold that we can detect it. We have decent noses, but we don't bother to sniff things. Um, the detection threshold is really different depending on the odorant. So some objects, they really need that minimal amount. Others, they might need more like a millionth of a gram, much, much more. I'd like to pick up on something you said, it, uh, dogs can detect cancer. And I understand that they can detect certain kinds of melanoma. And you also said diabetes. So I wonder if that suggests that we are emitting something from our skin. Is it our skin that they're smelling? Yeah, it, that's an interesting question. We don't really know, actually, what it is in the cancerous cells that the dogs are noticing, but they do seem to mark a difference. So the initial reports of dogs who were detecting cancers were actually inadvertent melanoma detection dogs. These were owned dogs, not trained in anything, who had been kind of bothering their owner's legs or arms. And after months, the owner goes to the doctor, finds out um, they have a melanoma in that area. And because of stories like that, which were published in The Lancet, researchers started doing dedicated testing to see, oh, if you give a dog samples of exhaled breath, can they detect the exhaled breath that has, uh, that come from a lung cancer patient? If you give them plasma from the body of, of an ovarian cancer patient, can they dis learn to distinguish it from a person who doesn't have ovarian cancer? And they can do that. 
But what it is exactly in those samples that they're detecting is actually an open question. In fact, there are researchers trying to figure it out. There are hundreds of odorants in those samples. What's the one or the combination of them that the dog detects? People would like to know because they'd like to create an electronic nose that could find that same odorant, but they, they haven't done that yet. What's extraordinary about the story that you told us is that the dog recognized it as anomalous, that it was not right. How do you explain that? I think that's the most interesting thing about imagining the perceptual experience of an animal whose primary sense is something other than vision. The world must be rendered a certain way in olfaction to a dog, typically, and they're likely to notice a change in it. And so if their person smells a certain way, ordinarily, and then there is a distinct change in their smell, they'll probably be attuned to it. In fact, our olfactory system works the same way. In principle, we notice new smells. So you come into a room that smells strongly of coffee. It's If you're a coffee drinker like I am, it's a delightful smell. After a while, it disappears. Our nose literally adapts to it, right? The cells stop firing, so we stop noticing it. You have to leave the room, change, in other words, the air that you're smelling, and then come back in to notice it again. So what the dogs are there doing is noticing the difference, and that's what an olfactory system is exactly designed to do. Dogs are very good at detecting their owner's smell, but if we really scrubbed ourselves down or maybe put on perfume or did something to our own scent, would we succeed in masking the smell from our dogs? I, no, I don't think so. There's a, there's a scene in Cool Hand Luke where the character is trying to escape from prison. The, the dog, their dogs are after him and he's trying to escape and he crosses rivers so that they can't catch his trail. Of course, they can catch his trail and he puts down pepper and this works to get the dogs off his trail. It would not work. You could cover yourself in pepper. The dog, you still smell the way you smell. I think what that points out is the difference between our human understanding of how we or others smell we think of it as like a, an event, like, oh, I smell now. No, no, no. Like, it's a state. We always smell. Like, we have a smell. Things have a smell. That's okay. That's who you are. What is interesting, too, about the difference between dogs and humans is we, as you say, we, we think that it's binary. Things smell or they don't smell, but we also render a judgment on those smells. Coffee and burritos, for example, smell great. Other things, garbage, do not smell good. But there's not a lot of in-between. But you write that for a dog, this is not so. Uh, they, they're not rendering a judgment. They're not things that they like to smell or things that they don't like to smell. I think for the most part, that's the case. I think of an analogy to our visual system. When we open our eyes and look at the room in front of us, we're seeing the room. It's information. And we're not saying, oh, that's a good white. Oh, that's not good gray. That's, oh, that's very curvy. I don't like that. They were, we're just acknowledging it. It is the fact of the world hitting us through our eyes. For the dog, the room is wrought of odors, so it's information at that same level. That isn't to say they wouldn't make any qualitative distinctions, but we do know, and in fact, you know, almost any dog owner could testify that dogs are often not disgusted by the types of things we think are disgusting. Even if they roll in it. Even if they roll in it, exactly. There are lots of, and rolling is presumably um, an acknowledgement of how delightful they find that smell, but they want themselves to be perfumed with it. Now, I wonder if we could talk about just how it is that the dogs are able to do what dogs do and what their olfactory receptors are like. And if you could take us inside the snout of a dog, what is going on there that makes them such powerful sniffers? Well, we don't know exactly what it is that makes them such good sniffers. There are a lot of components. One is, as you alluded to, the olfactory receptor cells. So at the back of the nose, their nose and ours, there are little cells entirely dedicated to grabbing odors out of the air. And they simply have hundreds of millions more cells in the back of their nose than we do. So presumably that is one big component of why they are detecting things and acting on things that they detect much, much more than we typically are. Um, their whole nose is really organized in order to smell well. So they have that long snout, which has all these turbinate bones in them, which are basically just bones, some of which might also have those olfactory receptor cells on them. But also they can 
warm and humidify the air coming in, making it easier to pull out the odors and filter out anything which would irritate the nose and damage those cells. I imagine it like a roller coaster ride for the air tumbling through the nose. We don't have that long snout that allows for that big wind up basically before the delivery in the olfactory receptor cells area. So they take these deep breaths and they can hold it and they can hold the, the odor in their nose way at the back and then process what's going on. And they also have stereoscopic nostrils. Is that how you put it? Yeah, yeah. Their, no their nostrils work independently to grab a different area of the odor space. So with that ability, they can actually sort of render the world in 3D, three olfactory dimensions. Can you elaborate on that? So a dog can say, to my left is the coffee shop and to my right is my owner. I mean, is it, is it, can they distinguish in that way? Sure, they can tell the direction of a source odor, just in the same way that our eyes overlap in the, in the visual field. They both get a different little snapshot of the world. It overlaps, but then the brain reconstructs. Well, what does that mean? If, I, if I'm getting an image from my right, a far right eye, but I'm not getting it from my left eye, it's probably on my right. And the same thing with odors. Um, as they're passing by, you'll get a stronger amount from one nostril than the other, and the brain can use that information to say, and the source of the odor is to the side. We've all had the awkward moment when dogs either come up and, and sniff us, or they sniff each other's rears. And I'm wondering what kind of information they're getting from those sniffs. Yeah, with dogs, they're getting a lot of identity information. And that includes sex. If it's a female, uh, whether they're in estrus or recently in estrus, probably things such as how long ago they last ate, maybe what they ate their health, you know, we wear our health and our smell as those cancer patients indicate, but anyone who is sick um, has a different smell. So all that information about who the dog is, is what the dog is getting. It's just like when we give each other a, a handshake or a glance when we meet, we're getting some information about all those things. With humans, I think that where dogs sniff are where we're the smelliest, basically. And it's information, again, not that they're going to use in the same type of way that they'd use with a conspecific, but information about who we are. They're not trying to make us feel awkward at that dinner party when we <laughs> enter. They, they're awfully good at doing it, but I think that they're innocent. They're not trying to, right? I, I find it fascinating. We're so nervous about smell and smelling as humans that not only does a dog smelling your crotch feel awkward, like, oh no, now everybody knows I have a crotch, or I don't know what it is, but also now I feel like it's often the case that a, a person's dog sniffing another person's dog's rump is viewed by the people often as impolite, where they're not even being sniffed, right? But it's that some, by extension, my dog's interest in your dog's rump is somehow reflecting on us. That, to me, is mostly a testament of our unease with smell. In fact, you write that our discomfort with the dogs sniffing the world has prompted some owners to pull their dogs back. And so dogs aren't sniffing as much as they would like to because they're getting the signal that they shouldn't be sniffing, although that's what they do. Right. I don't think we're ready to accept often that dogs are sniffing creatures. We want them to be polite, civilized creatures who don't do that animalistic thing, like sniffing each other. And I found that um, a lot of dogs who are coming into my studies where I'm basically asking them to sniff something I put on the floor, um, a sample of their own pee. Other times it's a quantity of food. It's, it, they're usually benign stimuli. A lot of dogs who come in with their owners won't approach the samples. And I think it's because the owners have been spent a lifetime telling that dog not to sniff things. Actually, when we pull our dog away from those smells, we're telling them they're not allowed to, you know, use that perceptual organ. And they and they're pretty cooperative. They kind of stop using it as much. That's sad. Yeah. I mean they can learn to use it again, right? And when they come upon this, you know, it must be like discovering your own superpower. Now, I was amazed to learn that dogs can smell well, it's not, it's not surprising that they could smell the movement of air through the room, but because they can do that, you write that they can actually smell the time of day. So I'm wondering if you could tell us the difference between how afternoon and morning smells. 
Yeah. Or what would a dog say? <laughs> I wish I knew exactly. But I think I can almost imagine a little bit. It's like the way a seasons have a different smell, right? We might notice the advent of spring. But a lot more is happening when the seasons change than in our living room throughout the day. Well, the temperature of the room changes all day, right? I think that's what it is. It's that air flow through the day is pretty reliable. Um, air rises along the walls as the room is warmed and then it kind of hugs the ceiling and then starts falling and it kind of crashes into itself imagery of this is kind of wonderful like uh, backwards waterfalls of air going up the walls and then and then crashing down as a waterfall in the middle of the room so i haven't seen an example of how dogs do use this to tell the time of day but we can see that dogs are attuned to odors in different parts of the room at different times of the day so they're presumably marking the day by this airflow this natural airflow um, so for instance, one's own smell in the room will be moved to the side of the room in your absence as the day goes on. When you were going through the self-directed experiment on trying to improve your own smelling ability so you could smell like your dog, um, did you ever sit in a room and, and try to see if you could smell the different times of day? I haven't sat in the room the way dogs might sit in the room all day and try to smell the difference. I don't think I have the acuity for that. But I have done other, and I regularly do other exercises still that try to bring smell in prominently. So when I wake up in the morning, I try to smell how late it is, you know, if, I've, if I don't set an alarm. So, and wait, wait, hang on, how, how do you smell how, how late it is? What, what is that's it. What's 6 a.m. versus 9 a.m.? That's, that's exactly what you're trying to smell. You're trying to smell kind of the warmth of the day, how much of the day has happened. There is a smell in a room at a certain time of day, and I think you might notice it if it was different. It's that type of thing, and I also try to figure out if there's anyone in the bed with me. You know, our dogs sleep with us, and so I have my husband, my cat, and two dogs, and my son, who might be in the bed in the morning. And without hearing or seeing anything, I try to just notice by smell if anyone's in the bed. And sometimes I can do it, not, not reliably, not all the time. But that's the type of thing I try to do to imagine a little bit what it might be like to be that dog. I assume you've invested in a king-size bed? <laughs> yeah, it's the biggest bed you can get, yeah. Alexandra Horowitz, thank you so much for speaking with us. My pleasure. Alexandra Horowitz is a dog cognition researcher at Barnard College and author of Being a Dog, Following the Dog into a World of Smell. Well, before you have a pity party about what you're missing, lamenting the fact that you'll never have the sniffer of a schnauzer or the proboscis of a Pekingese, the nostrils of a Newfie, we bring you good tidings. Your own schnoz is actually pretty good, at least while you're awake. Coming up, how your nose helps you savor a fine meal and even pick your future mate, and then it catches Z's when you do. We're making air apparent on Big Picture Science. When it comes to our senses, we can see, as it were, why we're grateful for our acute vision and for our exquisitely sensitive hearing. The sense of smell may be number one for a dog, but for humans it's often rated as least important. It's the dispensable sense, uh, the one that people would be willing to lose if they had to lose one. But reconsider, our sense of smell is not only better than we think, it is more important than we think. Smell plays a big role in love and even survival and we need it to fully enjoy the taste of food. If you're skeptical about that, here's an experiment. Get a couple of jelly beans, different colors, so you know they're gonna have different flavors. Put one in your mouth and plug your nose at the same time. Now bite down on the jelly bean, and with your nose still plugged, all you should taste is sweetness. Then release your nostrils, and you will be shocked by the experience of suddenly having the flavor of licorice or lime or bubble gum or whatever the jelly bean is. And that's a fantastic way of really illustrating how surprising it is, how much our sense of smell is involved with what we consume. But what about the role that our sense of smell plays in those other things like love and survival? Well, cognitive neuroscientist Rachel Hers says that our sense of smell was the first sense to evolve. 
It's located in a part of the brain associated with memory and emotion. So if you haven't already had the honor, maybe it's time to meet your nose. It's more than a resting place for your glasses. We sometimes read a reference to the extraordinary ability of super smellers who conduct odor tests and pick out delectable foods. Should we envy them? Super smellers, as far as I know, don't exist. There are people who are quote-unquote noses, and that's um, people who are in the perfume industry primarily who are very good smellers, and mainly because they have been trained and also because they're paying exceptional attention to what they are smelling, and the more attention we pay, the more we can actually smell because the more of our brain is being used. But the other thing is that we all, in fact, have a unique nose when it comes to the receptors that are expressed, which means that for some people, specific odorous compounds are going to smell somewhat stronger because of the fact they may have more of a specific kind of receptor that's sensitive to those compounds. And for others, it's going to smell weaker or there's different ones for each person. So there may be people who are super smellers of a specific kind of chemical, if that is even true, but it isn't the case that there are super smellers the way there are super tasters. And super tasters are something different. What can a super taster taste that, uh, you know, I as a non-super taster can't? Well, you may actually be a super taster. So super tasters taste everything more. That is to say they get more sweetness and more saltiness and more bitterness especially and sourness from the taste that they perceive. They also get more creaminess when they're eating something fatty or, you know, luscious like ice cream and more spiciness when they're eating a hot pepper. Now, what a super taster has is actually more taste buds on their tongue than people who are tasters or non-tasters. There's three classifications. So you're either a super taster a taster or a non-taster. And super tasters have the most taste buds. Tasters are like in between. They're sort of the Goldilocks version and the non-tasters have the fewest. Let's get back to our sense of smell then. Our, our nose is actually pretty good at smelling. Uh, apparently we shouldn't sell our noses short. It's essential. We know it's essential to taste food and to enjoy the roses, but you also have written that it's essential for relationships what we've found and other people have as well is that it's especially essential for women in terms of relationships. So in terms of the sensory feature that women find the most attractive and which is most important for them in terms of selecting a lover is actually how a man smells because she can only have a certain number of children in her lifespan and it's actually not that many. So she wants to make sure that the children that she does have are going to survive and thrive. And the most important thing for that is health. And it turns out that body odor is the external representation of the genes of your immune system. And so the smell of somebody is actually an, an indication of their immune system. And the smells from men that women find most attractive are indicative of the fact that their immune systems are actually complementary and that the likelihood of having a child who is most healthy is there. So what about pheromones? Uh, everybody hears about pheromones. I mean, uh, the women uh, select uh, males, uh, according to what you've said here, on the basis of how they smell. Is that pheromones? Are pheromones telling us anything? Do they exist? Pheromones do not exist in humans. Pheromones are a form of chemical communication. They were first discovered in the social insects like ants and termites. They are also exist in primates from the point of view of being able to give cues for a reproductive status. But in humans, there's actually no evidence for any kind of pheromonal communication. Smells, on the other hand, are something that we notice between each other and we can become attracted to or are attracted to or turned off by. And so the real body odor from someone or even the cologne or the perfume they're wearing can have a dramatic impact on attraction, but not pheromones. There's no such thing as pheromones per se. Well, wait a minute. You say that, uh, you know, if uh, somebody I meet is wearing perfume or if I'm wearing aftershave, obviously that can overwhelm the body odor. That was the original idea of these products, I think. And it sounds like a, a blatant attempt to cheat Mother Nature, but you're suggesting that it might even work. Yes, as a matter of fact, we have evidence that it does work for women in particular, that when a man smells really good, regardless of whether it's because he's just walked out of the shower sparkling clean and doesn't have anything on, <laughs> including cologne, or if he's wearing her favorite cologne, then she's going to find him attractive. Really? Okay. Now, your new research suggests, Rachel, that our ability to smell uh, varies to, over the course of the day. You've learned that, for example, we don't smell you know, very well. I, I don't mean how we smell, but our ability to smell uh, when we're asleep. Is, is our smell diminished for a reason? 
first of all, there's two findings that we have. One is that while you are asleep, you actually cannot smell. So that is to say that if there was a fire going on, you know, the smoke and so forth, you would not be able to perceive it if you were in deep sleep or in dreaming sleep. Our second finding has to do with the circadian phase effect, which is that in the circadian phase that would roughly map on to a clock time of, let's say, between 2 a.m. and 10 a.m., our sense of smell is, is diminished. And so the question is, why would that be the case? One of the reasons maybe why is that if we're sleeping during that time, it doesn't need to be turned on to the same extent because most likely we're awake during the other period of time and that's when our sense of smell is actually at its peak. It seems to be at its peak, in fact, at about nine in the evening on average. And that may have significance from the point of view of being able to get the most bang for our buck from the evening meal because from the point of view of sort of the anthropology of food, it seems as though ancestrally the evening meal was the biggest meal of the day and the most important meal of the day and sometimes the only meal of the day. And therefore, if you potentially don't have all that much food, it's if you can get more flavor from smell, you're going to become more satiated. And the other thing actually relates back to sexual behavior in that mammals um, often mate at night and from the point of view of smell being very important for finding the best mate, that may be also why. So in other words, wake up and smell the coffee, as nice as that sounds, doesn't actually happen. We don't wake up because we smell the coffee. We wake up and, th and then we smell the coffee. That sounds like an interesting distinction. Yes, that's exactly true. And sometimes it could be that you have, we have what's called micro awakenings throughout the night. So we can wake up very, very briefly. And if somebody's brewing a pot of delicious coffee right beside you and you notice that, then that can wake you up further. And it can feel as though the coffee woke you up, but actually you're already awake. What about the necessity of smell from the standpoint of our survival, our evolution? How important is smell? I mean, everybody understands that vision is very important. You can see predators. You don't miss grabbing that next branch. Uh, you know, sound is good because you can hear things that you can't see. But, you know, being able to tell whether my socks need washing or not, I mean, how does, how does smell help uh, us survive? Or perhaps more importantly, how did smell help our ancestors survive. Our primate relatives depend on smell much more than we do for all the basics of survival, for finding mates, for finding food, for detecting predators and so forth. But um, we certainly use smell from the point of view of the color our, of our existence. So smell really gives the backdrop of our existence. So especially from an emotional perspective, it also is most linked to memories compared to any of our other senses and evokes the most vivid and emotionally involving memories. Memories. So our sense of smell is, I think, connected very deeply to the basic emotional aspects of survival. So from the point of view of detecting predators and whether or not you need to avoid them, certainly from the point of view of the smells that are connected to fruits and berries and, and any other thing that you come across, knowing, for instance, that smell indicates that meat is rotted and you shouldn't eat it, that's highly significant for our survival. And certainly knowing that the smell of certain burning substances indicates real danger is also extremely important to survival. Some smells are revolting, presumably there's a reason for that. Well, again, I'm going to have to say that there are no such things as innately revolting smells, except for smells that may also feel burning at the same time. But you have to know that that smell actually is indicative of a dead body or someone who's just thrown up or whatever the case might be in order to decide that that's disgusting. It isn't the case that we're born knowing that. In fact, infants show completely different and sometimes totally opposite responses to smells that adults in the same culture find disgusting. So it's actually a learned response to find something disgusting or to find something lovely. Okay, so the fact that some people like the smell of, say, toasted coconut and others don't, that, that's a learned response. Yes, and that has to do with your personal associations and the personal meaning of that smell to you. Finally, Rachel, I've never really thought that my sense of smell was uh, either good or even important, but it does sound like despite its limitations, my sense of smell might be just as important to my survival as uh, my hearing. 
Well, I definitely think so. In fact, I think that our sense of smell is more important to our survival than pretty much any of our other senses. And that has to do with an enormous impact it plays on our emotional life and our psychological well-being. People who lose their sense of smell often fall into very serious clinical depressions, and every aspect of their life becomes upended in ways that they had no idea was going to happen to them. And so I think that actually our sense of smell is directly connected to all the profound aspects of what make us who we are. Rachel Hertz, thank you so very much for speaking with us. You are very welcome. Rachel Hertz is a cognitive neuroscientist at Brown University, and she is the author of The Scent of Desire, Discovering Our Enigmatic Sense of Smell, and more recently, Why You Eat What You Eat. Well, so what we're hearing in the show is all the stuff around us, this air, is actually filled with information. One form of that is odor. Yeah, well, I find it interesting that this is the only sense we have where we don't need technology to extend it around the globe. You want to hear something far away? Radio. You want to see something far away? Television. You want to smell something far away? Hey, the atmosphere does that for you. Well, thanks to the team who always has good sense. Senior producer Gary Niederhoff, operations manager Barbara Vance, and intern Sarah Derwin. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the composition and orbits of asteroids. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called Air Apparent. And if you want to hear more Big Picture Science episodes, well, you'll find them in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to broadcast radio, because after all, radio is on the air, even though it's not really, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like this show. I like the scent of the ocean and the beach. Ginger. Lavender. New car smell. I don't really smell anything. I smell my own cologne.